This is Dr. Karen, and you are listening to the DeFacto Leaders Podcast, where I help pediatric therapists become better leaders so they can make a bigger impact with their services. On this show, I'll share up-to-date evidence-based practices, my own experiences, and guest interviews designed to help clinicians and educators feel more confident in the way that they serve their caseloads so they can help school-age kids grow up to be successful, kind, well-adjusted people. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 106 of the DeFacto Leaders Podcast. In this episode, I interview Sharon Fuller, the founder of The Attachment Place. Sharon began her journey with developmental trauma disorder, also known as reactive attachment disorder, when she and her husband first adopted back in 2005. She's a mom to nine children, six of them biological, and three who were added to their family through adoption. Sharon and her husband realized that they were ill-prepared to parent their adopted children, and they definitely weren't prepared for the impact that their trauma would have on the entire family. So that's really what inspired her to create the attachment place. So from 2012 through 2018, the attachment place helped close to 100 children transition back to their homes and also form attachments to their parents. And the majority of these children were adopted. We talk through all sorts of topics, including why kids with trauma histories need clear boundaries in order to feel safe and form attachments, as well as some of the issues with very permissive, loose parenting approaches, and why we actually need to do the opposite in order to help these kids establish trust and form strong relationships, as well as strong independent skills in adulthood. So, If you are working with kids who have experienced trauma, you're going to love this interview. One of the issues that comes up in this conversation is the fact that when Sharon and her husband initially took their daughter to therapy, they found that the therapist was reporting she's doing great, making progress in therapy in this social group with these other children. But unfortunately, they did not notice those changes carry over to their home environment because they were not receiving any type of coaching or parent training. So in this conversation, we talk about why it's so important for there to be a team approach when you are working with kids, whether it be for social emotional issues, whether it be trauma, or whether it be for cognitive skills. So that's why in the School of Clinical Leadership, I help pediatric clinicians who are supporting kids in K-12 to work more effectively as a multidisciplinary team. Specifically, there's a huge emphasis in building resilience and executive functioning and really how to help your team develop programming and supports across the day if you are working in the school setting. So if you are a speech pathologist, a social worker, a psychologist, a counselor, or anyone else who is on the IEP team, and you want to know how to help support your kids' mental health and executive functioning skills so that they can develop independent skills, so they can develop strong academic and vocational skills, as well as form strong relationships, then you'll definitely want to check out the School of Clinical Leadership. In the program, I share specific techniques you can use in a therapy setting, in a classroom setting, as well as what parents need to support kids in the home so that kids can build the executive functioning skills that they need to be independent and successful. I will also support you in creating a plan so that you can actually make time to build the relationships and train the other people on your team who need this information. So there's a huge emphasis on developing your leadership skills so that you can actually put these supports into place because it's way more than just delivering direct therapy. You really need to get your team on board and take on a leadership role. And with the right systems and processes, this is possible even if you aren't in an official leadership position. So to learn more about how to become a member of the School of Clinical Leadership, you're going to want to go to drkarendudekbrandon.com backslash clinical leadership. Again, that's drkarendudekbrandon.com backslash clinical leadership. Now, 
please enjoy this interview with Sharon Fuller from The Attachment Place. Today, I am joined by Sharon Fuller from The Attachment Place. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Sure. Thanks for having me. So I thought we'd start off by just, you know, having you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Sure. So I am a mom to nine kids and uh, three of those kids were added to our family through adoption. And so um, I hadn't really intended to adopt, but I went on a missions trip in 2004 and uh, my heart broke for the orphans. And so I just really felt like I wanted to do something. It was one of those things where, you know, I couldn't go back and just live my life the same way. So made the decision to adopt and really went in very naive, naively, just thought, you know, um, these kids need a home and they need love and they need a family and we can give them that. And uh, so ended up out of our depth pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. So Anyways, that led me on a journey of becoming a coach for parents and kids who are struggling with trauma and attachment issues. I know that we have talked before and you, you have nine children. So six, six of them you had, and then you adopted three after the mission trip. So how old are all, what are the age ranges of all your kids? Uh, Age ranges are 37 to 18. So um, I know in your business, you, this experience inspired you to do what you do. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So like I said, we realized pretty quickly we were out of our depth, just um, the kinds of behaviors that we were seeing with our one adopted child in particular were out of, outside of the realm of what we had experienced. And I just kept thinking, well, this has to be orphanage behavior. You know, it's, it's going to get better as time goes on. And unfortunately it did not get better as time went on. And so um, by the time the child had been with us, um, maybe eight months, uh, she was in kindergarten and the kindergarten teacher was calling me and telling me, you know, she hadn't had these experiences either in teaching in 20 some years where my daughter would go up and take her keys off of her desk. She was, you know, taking things from other children. And so she recommended therapy. We got her in therapy. And at that point in time, I heard some terms I hadn't heard before. I heard, um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. I heard uh, borderline reactive attachment disorder. And so those those terms I hadn't heard. Um, but the the therapy that they had her in was not you know, they said she was doing well in, they had her in a little group setting with some other little girls and they would give me feedback. Like she shared her stickers nicely today, but you know, that really didn't translate to anything in our world, what we were dealing with. We were dealing with meltdowns that would go on for hours and hours. Um, you know, just all kinds of behaviors, like I said, that we had not seen before. And so that led me to start doing some research and, finding a different therapist and um, just really starting to get educated and informed myself and trying to really understand what was going on. But that was back in 2005. So there wasn't nearly as much information about trauma and attachment as there is now. So in our journey, you know, we actually ended up having to send her to out of home placement for a period of time, which was extremely difficult, although so was living with all those behaviors and it was really affecting the whole family and I think as a parent, that was one of the hardest things was seeing how it was affecting everybody else. And so, you know, we, we weren't really making the progress in therapy that we wanted to, and then trying to translate those things to home, the home environment was not working. I didn't have an understanding of how to break that down and do that at home. So I was getting a little bit of understanding of what was driving behaviors, but not really what to do. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, by the time like I said, we had found the, the right kind of therapist and everything. It just, it, we ended up needing to send her to a home placement, which um, was extremely difficult. Um, and, but also gave us all that break because we were so burned out. And so again, just as a mom to other kids, you, you find that your other kids are getting put on the back burner um, and really for long periods of time while you're trying to deal with what's going on with this one particular child. So Anyway, my heart really, you know, was uh, towards wanting to help other parents and kids who were struggling with those things. So I went on to do some therapeutic respite, um, 
ended up getting a certification, a professional certification in trust-based relational intervention, TBRI. Um, and so I did some respite part-time, a couple of clients, and then we ended up moving in 2012, bought a farm uh, with the intention of doing that full-time. So started taking kids in and we had that business from 2012 to 2019 um, kids would stay with us anywhere from short-term respite stays, what you typically think of as respite, you know, maybe a weekend or a week so their family could have a break. Mm -hmm. But most of our clients were long-term. So they were about nine to 18 months. They would stay with us. We would work with them on learning how to trust, learning how to, you know, disarming their fear, breaking down, helping them break down walls so they could start to let love in and start to build relationships and attachments and then coaching their parents while I was doing that so that they could learn, you know, what needed to be in place, the essential things to have in place to help their kids feel safe with them. And so that they could make that transition back home. So close that business in 2019 to spend more time with our family. And then, um, you know, then the pandemic happened. So actually that time was uh, pretty yeah. providential, but we ended up, um, you know, so I ended up continuing on in the coaching business, but I had really wanted to, establish something that really, you know, because you're, you're really saying and doing the same things over and over with parents, taking them through this process. So I wanted to develop something more like a curriculum that would actually be a system for helping parents and taking them through that process in, in more of a um, formal way, I guess, than, you know, uh, what I was doing in the past. Yeah. Wow. That's a fascinating story. So with, can you explain with, so I have a couple questions, a couple directions sure. I could go. So you Back to when you were talking about how you were taking your daughter to therapy and they were saying she's doing great, sharing the stickers or whatever it is right, here, right. but you weren't necessarily seeing it translate to other environments. Right. So was it typically just you went and dropped her off for therapy and then that was it and that was the model that they were using? Exactly, which I learned later is not how you do any type of attachment therapy, right? If a child has a diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder, which you know, nowadays, that's not the diagnosis that they usually use. It's developmental um, trauma, you know, that they have. And so they, it, it's, yeah, that is not, you want to keep parent and child together because yeah. you really want to work on that bond. So, um, but yes, that was the model that was being used. Yeah. And so, I mean, for that particular scenario, obviously you would need the parent involved, but really yeah. for anything that where you have behaviors that you're working through or where you have anything like that, even if it's not reactive attachment disorder, ADHD, yeah. for example, autism, yeah. all yeah. of those things, if you don't have parent involvement or you're not training other people who are working with that child across the day, like with a lot of the clinicians that I work with, they're in a school. And so it's, it's similar where it's, they're saying, oh, I'm seeing this progress in therapy. And the teacher's saying, well, it's totally different in my classroom. I'm not seeing that progress. Exactly. Or same thing, parents are seeing something totally different at home. And so if you're not, if you don't have a model for parent coaching, that is just huge. I mean, if you don't have that component, anything that goes on in therapy is not going to translate if the parents don't know how to structure their day the right way. Absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's something that is really important for people to realize sure. with respite care. Mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit about what the purpose of that typically is. You explained a little bit, but. Yeah. Um, I mean, by the time the parents brought their children to us, you know, they desperately needed a break. And so obviously that short term could provide the break. But if you were really, you know, if they really were looking to have things change, which is what ultimately they wanted, right? Um, they didn't really want to have to go back to the way things were. That's when the longer stays would come into play. And that's when, you know, we could really work with the child in a on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment uh, basis. And so, we, you know, things were done in-house. Uh, we did it all in our home. So we were teaching them how to function in a family unit. And so how all, all, everything that's involved in family life, right? We were teaching them, like I said, how to break down walls and let others in. We were teaching them conflict resolution. We were teaching them reading social cues. We were teaching them, you know, how to 
have responsibility, do chores, those kinds of things, work together, play together, um, take responsibility for their actions, uh, all the things that are involved in reciprocal relationships and, and uh, you know, living in a family unit. And so, um, and then, like I said, working with the parents to help them to learn what we were doing, you know, they would come for visits, um, the children would go for home visits, I would often accompany them on home visits so that I could observe and make sure that, you know, they were translating to their home what they were doing with me in my home. And so, um, so the purpose was really to change the way things were going to get to the root of the behavior and you know, not just deal with behaviors, but get to what was really driving the behavior. And, and, uh, you know, so tutoring school was in house, um, therapy was in house. So really everything happened here pretty much. I mean, we had outings and did things like that, but, mm -hmm. you know, so that again, you were talking about that team. It's so important for every adult who's in that child's life, who plays, you know, a, a primary role to be on the same page. That's hugely important. And so we were able to do that by bringing people in home to, to work with them rather than sending them to school, you know, because for the time they were here working on what they needed to work on was, you know, education actually had to come secondary because, you know, yeah. these kids weren't really available to learn because they were so stuck in fight, flight, freeze that there wasn't a whole lot of bandwidth for them to actually be able to learn, but we had some great tutors that worked with them as well. So but they did much better in that environment than in the school environment because, you know, it can be very overstimulating for the kids. So, yeah. So what, what would the transition look like when they would transition back to their homes? And then would you have kids that would transition to a school eventually? Um, yes. So we, uh, not here, but um, so we would, you know, like I said, those, there would be those visits. And once the parent visits started, you know, if the child kept on track and was continuing to do well, those visits would get longer in duration um, and shorter length of time in between. So, you know, the first visit would happen here. Um, we, we served clients from all over the country. So, you know, parents would have to come to town and then they would get a hotel and then they would, you know, come and spend some time with their child just on our property. We have a farm, it's 25 acres, you know, the first day. And then if that went well, they might be able to take them out for like an hour the next day, hour and a half for lunch or whatever. And, you know, so it was very slow and incremental. Parents would come and join therapy sessions when they were in town, or they would sometimes be uh, on the phone doing the therapy sessions with us when they weren't weren't here, you know, when they were back home. So then the home visits would also get longer in length um, and closer together, you know, as far as like um, parent visits, and then they would start a home visit if they were doing well. And then, you know, we would keep increasing those. And so by the time they transitioned home, they had usually been home for about 10 to 14 day stretch so that we could make sure that, you know, everything was going well. Yeah. And then what kind of support would, once they transition to their home, what did the support look like after that? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, parents were encouraged to find a therapist. Um, I actually did encourage parents when they first went back home to homeschool, but not homeschool, not them be the homeschool teacher. So again, mm -hmm. get what we kind of the setup we have where you, they had a tutor where they could be present and close by for that bonding piece, you know, but to, to be able to have somebody come in who functioned as the teacher so that the parents didn't have to. And then different kids did different things. Some kids would transition to half day school or, you know, several days a week or that kind of thing, just depended on the child. We worked with children that had, um, you know, all kinds of diagnoses. So, um, but one of the more uh, frequent ones was fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in, in addition to their trauma. So, you know, again, trying to devise a plan that would work well for each individual child. And so I would meet with therapists and uh, schools and that kind of thing and, and, you know, help with that transition piece as well. So were these typically kids that had been adopted um, we served almost a hundred clients in, in that time period, um, and only two were not adopted, but had had early childhood trauma. Mm, okay. Yeah. Cause I, I could see, I could see how that would be a primary, a primary reason that they would be having a hard time forming attachments. Yes. How, what are the age ranges that you typically served? 
Um, the youngest we have was a four-year-old who came, you know, just for like two days at a time and, um, all the way up to, I think when we closed our oldest client was 27. Okay. Wow. So quite a range. Yeah. We had some young adults who, you know, whose parents had guardianship. Actually, we had one young adult whose parents did not have guardianship, but, um, but you know, all of the other young adults. And again, most of them with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder was the reason that the guardianship was needed. Mm. And were those, those kids who were older, well, I guess they would be young adults. They had been adopted as an adult or as a teenager later in life. Um, not necessarily. No. Sometimes so, parents have been looking for years for help. Yeah, I can I can imagine what that's like to go for years without without that support. So when you, I know that you have kind of a process that you take people through, mm-hmm. or that, and I you I know that you might have some some resources online where you kind of go through your overview, but do you have kind of a framework that you work through when you are coaching people? Can you share that sure. process? Sure. So the the framework that I have developed, I, I have named the environment matrix. And so that, again, it is a framework. What I tell parents is, you know, there is no one size fits all. We, we, you know, those of us who have kids realize that even if our kids don't have a trauma history, right, there is no one size fits all. But there are things that really need to be in place in order for our children to feel safe enough to let down their walls. And so those are the things that I go through, go over in the environment matrix and break down for parents. Um, I would say one of the biggest misconceptions parents often have is I need my child fixed. Right. And so, um, you know, and that is um, not going to work obviously because we can't change anyone but ourselves. So I start with parents by telling them you are the change agents in your family. You can't change anyone, anyone else, but you are the change agents in your family and change obviously trickles down and flows down as you yourself do your work. And so um, I start out having them realize that they are responsible for their unhappiness and wholeness. Mm -hmm. And often, you know, almost every time the child has really created this atmosphere of misery in the home where the parents are under it, everybody's under it. And those parents really being able to re- regain their parenting confidence and realize they have to take control of their own happiness. You have this one family member who is struggling and not doing well, but you can't allow that to affect you in a way that it takes, it robs your joy, right? And and causes you to not be able to show up effectively for your other children. Mm-hmm. So, um, So I take them through the process initially of being able to look at their, uh, what they bring to the table as parents. So, you know, their upbringing, their own parenting style, their attachment style, how they work together if they have a partner or spouse. So being on the same team, getting on the same page that that's, as we were talking about, so important for all of the adults involved to be on the same page. And often mom is typically the target um, because of that initial abandonment wound and that, that, primal wound of mom leaving them for whatever reason she had to leave them, but they are almost always blame themselves. But so mom is the target because they've guarded their hearts. They don't want to let another mom in. They've been hurt by a mom. And so sadly the dynamic we often see in relationships then is dad not being supportive of mom, but it can be the primary caregiver. So if dad's the stay at home parent, it can be dad also, Mm -hmm. but Mostly it's mom who's the target and dad, you know, not being supportive and being in a place of saying, well, she doesn't do that to me, you know, so I've seen that dynamic a lot, even when I was doing respite and parents were to a point where they were bringing their child for out of home placement. Sometimes dad was still in a place of going, well, she doesn't do that to me. And mom was just, uh, you know, she was at her wits end. So really helping parents get on the same page. So the program starts with them looking at themselves, looking at what they bring, re reclaiming their confidence, their happiness, their joy, you know, finding things in life to help them do that. And then it moves on to what our children need in place. Obviously they need that in place. That's the first thing that they need in place. Yeah. But secondly, it's looking at creating a therapeutic environment within your home. What does that look like? What does that mean? Learning how and when to adjust your expectations. So you have a child who might be 10, who might be functioning emotionally about half their age. And so what are reasonable expectations for this child? 
And then how do you know how and when to adjust those expectations so that you're not always keeping the bar down here? So slowly yeah. raising the bar and, you know, trying so that we can find out what they're capable of and then learning how coming up with a specific plan for each person's child, because again, there's no one size fits all. Um, really being able to learn to decode your child. So trauma, brain, behaviors, what's going on under the surface, getting to root causes rather than just focusing on behaviors, because that's another thing I see a lot is just being stuck in trying to manage behaviors and never really being able to get to the root. So you're never going to be able, again, to help disarm that child's fear and help them feel safe enough to stop doing the behaviors because behaviors are communication and they're trying to tell us something, right? So that's, that's the process that I walk them through. What are some common things that you see or behaviors that you see being misinterpreted when it's you know, the parents thinking it's one thing, but mm -hmm. really you, when you're digging deeper, you find that it's something else. Well, I would say, um, you know, parents tell me their kids are angry all the time, which um, is the way that they look, right? They do definitely come across as angry all the time. But what I know to be true is when a child is little and they don't feel safe and there's not someone there to help them with fear and sadness, fear and sadness get turned into anger, right? They hide behind anger because anger is a powerful emotion and fear and sadness are vulnerable emotions. And when you don't have a safe person to do vulnerable emotions with, you don't do vulnerable emotions. And so parents take it at face value and, and think that, you know, their, their child is angry all the time. The child feels angry all the time, but they just haven't learned how to even get in touch with their own feelings and figure out what, what they really are feeling. So that's one of them. I would say another one of them is because the behavior is directed at the parent, the parent takes it very personally and mm -hmm. gets hurt. And so, you know, that becomes a cycle as well of not being able to separate themselves from it enough to really try to figure out again, what is driving that? Is that, is that fear, fear of getting close? I mean, that's generally what it is, right? I, again, I don't want to let another person in because my heart has been hurt. And so I'm guarding my heart. And um, so that's another big one. I'm going to take a quick break and talk about a free resource that I've created for clinicians who want to learn how they can help their multidisciplinary teams work more effectively to support kids' mental health and resilience. What it is, is an executive functioning implementation guide. Many teams, especially teams working in the schools, struggle to provide mental health, behavioral, and social skills support because it's so hard to get teams working together effectively. But in this Executive Functioning Implementation Guide, I share exactly what everyone on the team can be doing to support these essential skills. Inside the guide, you're going to learn how to improve students' social relationships and emotional regulation when behavior management and social skills groups aren't working. I'll also share why talk therapy falls short for many kids with anxiety and what to do instead. I'll share the culprit behind procrastination, disengagement, and poor work completion, and how to address it without punishment. And then finally, I'll cover how school clinicians can support mental health, resilience, and independence in kids, even if they aren't in a traditional leadership role. To download your free copy of the Executive Functioning Implementation Guide, you're just going to want to go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash efschools. Now, let's get back to the interview. Uh, I think really, you know, parents will say, some parents will say, my child is really independent. And that is a red flag, even though parents see that as a positive a lot of times, because with kids who haven't learned to trust, they come to your home independent. And you have to kind of parent backwards in a sense, because you're taking an independent child and you're teaching them how to be dependent so that you can teach them how to be healthily independent. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting because I'm guessing that they've had to do that for survival reasons, but maybe they haven't because they haven't had a trusting adult guide yeah. them through it. Maybe some of the choices that they've made aren't good ones. Maybe the behaviors and habits that they have aren't going to serve them in adulthood because just their brain wasn't fully developed when they were learning those skills. So they didn't quite have all of those reasoning skills to be able to figure out good ways to do it. Correct. 
But, yeah. Yeah. That's and really they really have to learn to trust. And I think that's the big thing when you have a child who is independent, right? They're not trusting you enough to parent them. And if you just allow that to continue, they're not ever going to learn how to trust. And that's the foundation of relationships. So in order for our children to learn how to do healthy relationships, obviously they need to learn how to trust. Yeah. Well, and w- something else that was really interesting to me because, you know, and again, I'm more in the ADHD and autism and working with those populations mm-hmm. where when you have a parenting style that is more authoritative, that that's actually very healthy for kids because it makes them feel grounded and they have someone who's helping mm-hmm. them regulate and it helps them to kind of keep their behaviors contained so that they, they are supported and they feel good about the way that they're acting versus Mm -hmm. not necessarily having that support and making choices that aren't the best and impacting the relationships and actually making them feel worse. And then, you know, figuring out how to do that. So that's, it sounds so counterproductive because you think, Oh, we should just, you know, let them do what they want, but actually it's better to, provide some guidance, but obviously if you have trust issues, then you have to address those first. Is that why you, when you transition kids back into the home that you recommend somebody else work on the academics and the parents aren't the ones that are necessarily doing the teaching? So a couple of things um, based on what you just said. So first of all, the first diagnosis our children um, with trauma usually get is ADHD. So every child I think that was ever in my program, except for maybe three or four had an ADHD diagnosis when they came in the door. Now, all of it wasn't necessarily true ADHD. I had a boy who put it beautifully, who was adopted at 11 from a special needs orphanage um, in Asia. And when he came to us, he was 14 and we worked on helping them learn how to regulate, get in touch with their feelings journal. And he said to me, Miss Sharon, I don't like to be still because when I'm still, I think, and I don't like to think. And so our kids with scary, hard memories Mm. don't like to be still and think they don't like to be alone with their thoughts. They like to be busy all the time. And so they present as ADHD. Um, So that's, that's the first thing I was thinking when you were talking. Secondly, our kids with FASD, FASD looks a lot like in a lot of ways, autism. So those two are, you know, very similar in the ways they Mm -hmm. um, present symptoms. Um, Of course, not all the way down the line, but I mean, there are a lot of similarities. Um, And what you were saying about, you know, needing that structure, that's absolutely true. The two things our children with trauma need in parenting, the most is high structure and high nurture. Those are the two two mm-hmm. pillars that they need. Um, and so they do need it, you know, because as much as they're fighting for control, it's scary to be a nine-year-old and be in control, yeah. right? Like oh, that, yeah. that's a terrifying thing. If you think, I say to parents, you know, if you think you're the smartest or the strongest in the room, meaning, you know, not necessarily physical strength, although some of them do think that as well, but you mm-hmm. know, that you're the one that can kind of hold things together and you're going to, you're going to figure it out. That's a terrifying prospect. So, um, so just wanted to say those things based on, you know, what you were saying, but as far as having someone else teach the child, it just takes that teacher hat off of the parent and kind of eliminates that area that can possibly be conflict, right? Because some of our kids struggle or a lot of our kids struggle with learning disabilities. Learning is hard for them. It's not something they're necessarily excited to do. And it can just be contentious for, you know, mom or dad to be uh, homeschooling them or teaching them. Yeah. Homework, homework can even be a nightmare. So yeah. You know, in school. I know that that's, that's something that comes up a lot with, you know, some of the families that I've worked with who are not homeschooling, but they still have to have to make sure that the homework gets done. And that can be a huge battle. A lot of school districts are going away from busy work homework, which I think is good. I think that it's good to, a lot of them are going more towards ongoing projects and less the busy work, which is a good thing, which can be helpful for parents because then the parents can just provide some structure. They don't have to sit there and handhold, but a lot of kids do need, do need more support. And then that does make it harder for parents. So yeah. And we actually had in our daughter's IEP, no homework could be sent home. It had to be done at school because it was such a hot button. So 
Yeah. Well, I think I can see if, if you get to the point where your child is in respite that you would, you would want to be very mindful of what responsibilities fell on the parent's plate when they did come back into the home. So that, that does make sense to me. So, yeah. Um, so what are, I, you've talked through a number of different misconceptions and things like that. What are some things that people get on stuck, get stuck on the most when you're working with them? Like, what are the biggest sticking points that you have to work through with people? I think that taking it personally um, and really feeling like, you know, I tell parents, you didn't create this problem, right? I mean, we might add to it out of ignorance of not knowing how to help them, you know, of um, uh, maybe either being misinformed or uninformed or ill-informed, you know, but we, we didn't create the initial abandonment. And so I think for some parents, that is a real, really, well, I know for some parents, that's a really freeing thing because there's a lot of guilt around behaviors. And, you know, I, I must not be a good parent. If I was a better parent, my child wouldn't behave this way. So I must not, you know, I, I must be doing something wrong. I must have somehow created this problem. And it's an interesting thing because even if, you know, the other three kids in the family are doing well, they're still... It, it's that guilt around not being able to help this child the way you want to help this child. So I think helping parents release that guilt and that um, taking things personally and being able to kind of, in a, in a sense, healthily detach from, from being able to take things personally so that you can help your child so that you can, again, get to the root causes, what's actually going on beneath the surface. And if you're, if you're stuck thinking it's about you and focused on yourself, you're not focused on what you need to do to be helping your child. Yeah, that is, it is very hard. I mean, I can tell from even, even as a professional, you know, Mm -hmm. when it's not your child, it feels so personal. (laughs) Yes, it does. It really does. And like I said, and a lot of these kids target mom, you know, so I mean, it is as if you have a big target on your back. So it's like, as the child is, you know, saying something really mean to you or something to say, don't take it personally. Yeah, it's a very hard thing to do, but it's a very freeing thing to do. Obviously, you know, we're we're human, we slip back into it at times, but the more you can learn how to separate yourself from it, the better off you are. So I'd say that's one of the major sticking points. And then another big one is, you know, taking how we were raised. And I, I work with and talk to a lot of grandparents who are raising their grandchildren. And so you know, we're talking a couple generations removed, right? And taking how we were raised and thinking, well, I turned out fine. So, you know, that's the way to do it. And then their child's doing something or saying something and they're like, I would have never gotten away with that kind of thing, you know? And so it's that rigidity in thinking it has to look a certain way and then getting sucked into the chaos because you you get in this power struggle where you're trying to have the last word, you know, you're, you're and, and you mm-hmm. get sucked into the chaos. And so I think that's another big one. And we talk about that a lot in our group. We have a group aspect uh, to my program. And it's like, we talk about that one a lot, you know, don't get sucked into the chaos. And um, it was funny. One of the grandparents that's in my program was saying that even the one grandchild was saying to the grandmother about the other grandchild, just walk away, grandma, just walk away. Like, don't get sucked yeah, in. yeah. So, don't get sucked into the, sucked the arguing. Into- that is... Exactly. I'm sure that's pretty common. Well, and you know, it's, it's interesting because you mentioned just generationally that there was, it's kind of swung from one direction to another and it needs to be in the middle where it was very, the authoritarian where it's my way or the highway, which is too rigid and is not, it's, it doesn't, it's very dismissive, but then you can't go too far in this other direction and have it be too loosey goosey because that's not good either because they need, they need clear they need yeah. clear structure and boundaries. And so you kind of have to come, come back a little bit. Right. Yeah. I always say that, you know, it's, I, I don't know if it's just our country or it's just people in general, but we go from children should be seen and not heard and the pendulum swings all the way over here to mm-hmm. where, yeah, there's no yeah, structure, no, no accountability. Right. And, you know, you're exactly right. We need to get it in the middle. I think I often think of that study they did years ago. You might be familiar with it where 
they removed the fences from the playgrounds because they felt mm. that they were too restrictive. And then all the kids gathered in the middle and, and huddled in the middle because they didn't know where the boundaries were. And mm. so I always think about that because it's like, you're exactly right. Our kids need to know where the boundaries are. Now, yes, they're going to test them. They're going to push them. Often with our adopted kids, they're testing you to see at what point you're going to get rid of them because they weren't allowed to stay, weren't able to stay with their birth parents for whatever reason. So in their mind, you know, birth parents got rid of me. So how far can I push you until you're going to do the same? And so there's a lot of testing of the boundaries, but, you know, they they need to know where the boundaries are and they need to know you're strong enough to hold those boundaries. But again, there's nothing black and white as far as rigidity, because you also have to take into consideration, is this a time I need to make an adjustment because there's something else going on that I need to figure out? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really interesting. I'm going to have to look up that study. <laughs> yeah, remember, I can't remember where I saw it in this name. I, I can't remember. I, I, okay. I want to look it up and include it in the show notes because that is, it's, it's such a nice visual to explain right. what gets debated back and forth so much why it's okay. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not always good to just be <laughs> Lord of the flies or whatever. Yes. <laughs> Which is actually what some of the orphanage life reminded me of. It's like, oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, what was I going to say? I, I had a, had a direction I was going to go with that discussion on boundaries. Oh, I know. So it reminds me, I cannot remember what, oh, I want to say it was some insurance company and the, the, the tagline for the commercial is just okay. is not okay. Where it's the guy's mm-hmm. coming in to fix your brakes and he's like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. <laughs> And then they have somebody who they're going in for surgery and the surgeon's coming in like, whoa, I'm pretty nervous. Like, like when, when somebody's taking care of you, you want them to be confident and to say, this is what's going to happen. And it's so calming when you can just, when you know that you're not equipped to handle a situation and you're just like somebody who knows better than you is going to take care of it and just tell you what's going to happen. And I think that some people get caught up in what we have to, you know, be a firm, affirm everything or give them what they want. But I mean, it, in that situation, do you, can you articulate what you want or need? Probably not. Yeah, no, they can't. Yeah. Cause like I said, a lot of times they're just stuck in fight, flight, freeze, and they don't even know. And I mean, so the learning how to to decode your child is so that you can help your child decode themselves. Right. And so when the kids came into our program, we just started with four basic feelings, happy, sad, mad, scared, you know, and even that could be a stretch for some of these kids, because again, they might only be familiar with mad. That might be the one that they have, you know, shown all of their lives. And so helping them be able to get quiet and go, you know, and and it's leading them through a process of, you know, here's a, book of baby faces. I mean, you could be 15 and I might need to pull out the book of baby faces and show you what the emotion looks like and that kind of thing. And some kids really just that being able to put language to emotions is always hard and you almost need context and experiences to be able to even have words to explain what you need or what you're feeling. And Yeah, that's that's something that is done a lot with with kids in these social skills groups where it's just, you know, let's look at pictures of these cartoony people and say (laughs) they're happy, they're frustrated. And I mean, if you haven't had the life experience to even know what that means, it's not going to translate into something useful. And that's why you see situations like you had where it's she's doing great in therapy, but I'm not seeing this translate to anything useful in my day-to-day because I don't know what to do in my day-to-day for, you know, for the child. So yeah, sharing her stickers was really the least of my concerns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's great, but <laughs> let's have, if we had other things in place, that would have been great, but yeah. Yeah. So what would you, what advice would you give a parent or even a professional who's working with a family or a particular client who is Mm -hmm. kind of in the trenches with, with a child who has a traumatic background and doesn't know what to do. I mean, Mm -hmm. what, what advice could you give them? Well, I think the advice I would give to parents would definitely be, you don't have to do it alone. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, It's so much 
easier. You know, we we can't we can't pour out of an empty vessel, right? We can't. It's the whole put on your own oxygen mask first, right? Like really, yeah. I think a lot of times as parents, we think that sacrificing ourselves forever, you know, um, and trying to help our child is what's healthy. And really, I would say, start with yourself, you know, um, get yourself in a place where you need to be and find your joy in life again and reclaim your confidence. And, you know, so that you can parent from that place of having your own self filled. So find a community, you know, be in a, it's, it's just essential to be in community with other people who get it. Mm -hmm. Um, essential to get guidance and help. But I think, you know, what I would say to parents and professionals is there is no um, relational trauma is only healed through relationships. And so if you're a professional who's working with a child, again, it's all about trust. It's all about gaining their trust. And our kids are very, they might miss a lot of things um, in some areas, but they're very in touch with tone of voice, um, you know, the, the look on your face, like body language is huge to them because a lot of these kids survival was reading their parents' body language. Right. And so, um, having even a raised eyebrow can cause this child to think you're angry with them. So really being aware of your physical presence, like how you're showing up, um, you know, when you're working with this child, if you're upset, they're going to think it's about them. Um, and so, for parents and professionals, that's hugely important, but prof for professionals who obviously aren't going to, you know, be with them all the time, just mm -hmm. creating that trusting relationship when you're with them and being really aware of if you're stressed, if you're struggling, trying to put that, leave that at the door when you come in to work with them, because they're going to pick up on all of that and they will absolutely assume it's about them. You don't like them, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and I think the main thing is, is that if you are a professional, that the parents absolutely need to be involved. I mean, yes. there has to be that parent coaching component or else, absolutely. or the, again, whatever, whatever other environment you're working with, the person mm -hmm. in that environment who's going to be with that child needs to know how to translate what you're doing to, to that situation. And you want to realize, you know, these kids like I said, mom is a scary figure to them because they're scared of being rejected by mom. So they often latch on to other people. And for some people that can really feed your ego, right? Mm -hmm. And realizing that you don't want to them to see you as their primary attachment figure. You you want to be sure that you are, you know, I agree with you, parents being in whatever session you're doing, if possible, unless you're working at the school with the child or yeah. whatever, it's not possible but you building the parent up in, in what, when you're with them, you know, I used to say to kids in respite um, and that was a different environment because I was becoming the primary attachment figure to transfer, help transfer that to the parents, yeah. so it's a little bit of a different thing, but um, you know, you being able to, I, I'd say things like, I really like your mom, you know, or I really like your dad. I think they're great. I, you know, that kind of stuff, just really trying to help with that confidence in their parent, like that I trusted their parent and I thought they, they had wonderful parents and that kind of thing. Yeah. That's, that's interesting how, so they would, they would attach to somebody else that wasn't their parent. Was it just because they felt more, that was a safer option for them? Yes. So, I mean, they are, you know, again, a lot of them are living with me from for nine to 18 months. So mm -hmm. I'm the one that's there day in, day out, you know, comforting them, all of that. Um, it is safer. It feels safer. Um, I would say the downside is there were some kids that had a hard time mm -hmm. making that um, transition to mom. And so um, that that is, you know, that's why in the work I do now, working with the parents who are the ones that are with their children you know, I think is a healthier model for sure. But there are times when children need to be out of home. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that could, I could see how, if you can keep them in the home yes. that and work through it and form Absolutely. the attachment with the parent, that that would be the ideal situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So where can people go to learn more about you and your program and you with the program that you run, do you mm -hmm. run it with somebody else? There's a, a social worker that you work with? 
Um, no, there was when we when we ran the um, respite program. We did have a therapist that came in, and um, so I worked with her for about five years, um, and you know, of course, learned a lot from her. Um, and we're still good friends. But no, she doesn't work with me currently. She has a private practice. Um, so I have a parenting program. Um, I you know, have everybody who's interested in talking to me about that, watch a webinar that I have first called Quieting the Storm. So anybody who's interested in getting information can email me um, at sfuller at theattachmentplace.com. I also have a website, uh, The Attachment Place, and a Facebook page and a Facebook group um, called Quieting the Storm of Adoption for parents who are looking to, to connect with other parents who our adoptive parents. Um, again, just reaching out to me via email is the, the easiest way. And then Great. I can send that link for that webinar. And um, that's if people are interested in talking to me, like I said, I have them watch the webinar first, just so they can get a feel for how I do things and what I do. And if that's mm-hmm. something that resonates with them, there's a link at the end of that to book a call. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here with me today. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. A couple things before I wrap up, please check the show notes for all of the links to where you can connect with Sharon. And also I will link to the study that we mentioned in this conversation about the fence on the playground. It's really interesting. You should definitely check it out. If you are supporting K-12 kids and you want to learn how you can get your team working together to provide mental health, behavioral, and social skills support for your caseload. And if you want to finally get your team working together effectively, really in all areas, definitely check out the School of Clinical Leadership and the Executive Functioning Implementation Guide. So the Executive Functioning Implementation Guide goes through some of the key concepts that are in the School of Clinical Leadership. So if you wanna get a taste for what is actually in the program, then definitely check out the guide. So to download the Executive Functioning Guide, you're going to want to go to drkarendudakbrannon.com backslash efschools. And if you want to check out the School of Clinical Leadership, you're going to want to go to drkarendudakbrannon.com backslash clinical leadership. Again, this is my comprehensive program that helps K-12 clinicians be better leaders. There's a huge focus on executive functioning because this should be part of all school leadership training. So not only do I give you the strategies that you can use in therapy and that you can train others to do across the day, you can also use these strategies to support parents in the home as well. So I'll give you those strategies and then I'll also support you in helping your team work together so that you can build the relationships you need to make this happen, as well as how to create the productivity systems that you need to get all of this done without burning yourself out. Again, that's drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash clinical leadership. Before I wrap up, I wanted to remind you that I am always looking for amazing guests to share inspiring stories of leadership on the show. So if you would like to be a guest, email me at talktome at drkarenspeech.com. Or if you have a suggestion for a guest, you can email me. That's talktome at drkarenspeech.com. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, it always helps me out so much if you rate, review, subscribe, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time. Mm-hmm.